Welcome to Crossroad Connection. My name is Art Benwaldi, and I am your host for this program. Ashley Lucas, who is professor at the University of Michigan and the director of the Prison Creative Arts Project, recently joined us at CBI to perform her one-woman play entitled Doing Time Through the Visiting Glass. She wrote the play based on interviews she conducted with people who have family members in prison. As she discovered through these interviews and through her own experience of having an incarcerated father, people with loved one behind bars are rarely asked to share their stories. Ashley's performance gives voice to these families. We hope you enjoy the highlights from the performance and the talkback sessions. Hi, I'm Ashley. Um, I'm writing this play about people who have family in prison. With more than two million people in prison in the United States today, I knew that there had to be more families like mine. I didn't know if they would talk to me, but I knew that I wasn't alone. <laughs> I was always different from my brothers. I left home when I was 18. I left home to join the Navy, and I, I moved out to San Diego, and, and I haven't moved home since. I've been in school ever since. None of my siblings had graduated from high school. None. Not my two brothers, not my two sisters. I hadn't even gotten to the 10th grade, any of them. So my mother dropped out when she was in the 8th grade. So, so that made me the first one in my extended family. And my extended family is huge. I mean, my mother's mother had eight children, and then all of those people had children, and there's like my cousins. So I think at one point I counted 78 of us. I was the first one to graduate from high school. So my being in academia, whew, I've just been in a different place from my culture. You know, that kind of separation, it, it distances you from your family. Uh, so like I said, I've got two brothers and two sisters, and they were involved in all kinds of things that I just couldn't imagine myself being involved with, be it uh, gangs, drugs, constant binge drinking, that sort of thing. So we were close, but we didn't share a lot of interests. Uh, <laughs> my, mother, my mother has this theory that the reason that I've lived such a clean life is because I was gay, and that that, that had allowed me to, uh, to disidentify if you will, with every kind of thing that my brothers had been involved with. And, and I know that since I was a little boy, I had disassociated from all of that, uh, the gangs, drugs. But it, it was always there. It was always a part of our family. Because if it wasn't my one uncle on my father's side, it was my brother's, it was an uncle or something who had been in prison. And it came to feel, as an institution, just an extension of those men that went in in our family. Just an extension of their lifestyle, because it wasn't like they were going to some place that was completely foreign to them. They, they had friends in there, they knew people, and many of them were Chicanos like us, so it, I just never felt like they were going to some place that was completely foreign to them. So it was like this. I was in school, they were in prison. Two very different institutions, but but somehow I think mine was more of a foreign experience than theirs was. In fact, I know it was for my family because they still don't understand what I'm doing. They don't understand graduate work. So like, like when my mother thinks about like what I'm doing, she can sort of picture it, but, but inside there's this huge black space and she's like, well, what's he doing, really? Whereas when I think they think about my brothers having been in prison, they can at least picture that a little more clearly. Come on, Annie. Come on, sweetheart. You want to look so pretty for your daddy when he sees you. Oh, don't chew on your dress, darling. That's disgusting. Uh, huh? Excuse me? Oh. oh. Well, now that depends. Um, are you having a regular or a contact visit? You've never been here before, have you? It's all right. Uh, so if you're having a regular visit, that means that you have to visit through the glass. So that guard over there is going to call your name, and uh, he'll take you back 
to where your loved one is, and then you'll sit there in the booth with the little phone thingy. Um, if you're having a contact visit, then you get to sit at those tables over there, and you'll just see them come around the corner to meet you. Oh, sure. It's no problem. You're very welcome. Uh, the first time is always the hardest. You, you can ask anybody. Who are you here to see? Oh, your son. <laughs> Ollie, sit still. You are driving me crazy. Uh, so you're, you're here to see your boy. <laughs> That's rough. Um, we're here to see my husband, Randy, and, um, well, I, that's hard enough. I can't even imagine if it was one of my kids. Whew. I, you know, I had those two over there before I met Randy, and then Ollie over here is Randy's from before he met me, and I was pregnant nine months with our little girl when he was arrested. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. It, his name's really Oliver, but I call him Ollie so that he'll feel like one of us. You see, my husband's Randy, and I'm Lucy, and that's Johnny, and Andy, and Ollie, and Annie. That's our little family. <laughs> oh, uh, well, now that's going to depend. How long you get to visit depends on how far away you come from. So um, if you drove here from over 300 miles away, you're going to get the long visit, which is four hours today and four hours tomorrow. But if you came here from somewhere closer than that, you get the short visit, which is just two hours today and no visit tomorrow. Oh, good, good, you'll get the long visit. That's great. The short one is just so short. Whew, I mean, it, the time just flies by, and the first visit really is the hardest. Anybody can tell you I was just scared to death. I mean, the first time we came, I, after the guards searched me all over, I felt just like a criminal myself. And then to watch them do that to my kids, my God. And I just, I couldn't hardly look at him without crying. I mean, Annie was only a few months old, and you can't take a baby bottle with milk in there to the visit. So she was fussy and upset. And, and I just didn't want this to be the first time that he saw his newborn baby. I mean, he couldn't even touch her. All I could do was hold her up in front of the glass. All I did was cry. Me and my boys cried all the way home. Andy, do not kick your brother. I swear if you do not stop that right this minute, I will leave you in this prison when the rest of us go home. <laughs> Kids, <laughs> these visiting days are just so long. I mean, I feel bad for them. All they do is sit all weekend long. We drive six hours to get here, and then we sit in this room for half an hour to an hour until they bring him out for the visit, and we go in there, and we have four hours with Randy, and when it's all over, I scoop up all my kids and take them to the motel up the road for the night and do the whole thing in reverse the next day. All my kids do all weekend is sit. Oh. All right, all right, okay. You're standing on my bladder, darling. Why don't you just get down for now and uh, why don't you go sit in Johnny's lap? Go on, baby. Mama is trying to have an adult conversation with these nice people here. Get moving. Oh, I am so sorry. You look absolutely terrified. I shouldn't have said all that stuff. It, it, it does get easier with time. You know, after you've done it the first few times, you, you get kind of used to how it goes, and then the whole visiting isn't such an ordeal. Uh, Johnny, do not give her that bubble gum. Give it to me right now, both of you. Right this minute, y'all are going to get us thrown out of here before we even start visiting. All right. I'm sorry. It's just that um, prisoners aren't allowed to have gum because they might stick it in the locks. So they'll take your visit from you if they catch you. And uh, I've seen people lose their visits for much less. <laughs>spoken to my husband in about three years. He um, He's in the federal prisons now and, and they've shipped him to some place in New Jersey uh, all the way across the country. I, I, I just can't afford the trip to visit. I know what you're thinking, all right? I, you think I could visit if I really wanted to, right? That, that I, the dutiful wife, should find a way. It's not that simple. I, it's not just the money, it's, it's the time, too. I mean, I can't be leaving work to go and see him. They would know that I was up to something. 
I am the only black woman in that office, and they watch me enough as it is. I refuse to spend the rest of my life being pitied or, or hated for something I didn't do because I'm a prisoner's wife. It's not my fault that I fell in love with a man who got in trouble. Look, I, I would call him if I could, but I can't do that. I, the phone companies just keep jacking up the prices because they know that prisoners' families will pay it. The only alternative is silence. My Eddie chooses silence. He won't write me letters either. Um, he says I should divorce him and move on with my life. He says that I deserve a man who can be with me every day. He even had some jailhouse lawyer draw up divorce papers and mail them to me. What kind of a person would I be if I discarded my incarcerated husband? I love Eddie. I do. But this is no marriage. I just don't know how much longer I can stand the silence. Hola. Si, si, of course, of course. Uh, come in. Um, disculpame, I was just cleaning the house before you came. Uh, please, sit here. Uh, yes, yes, I, I have un hijo. Um, he's five years old now. He, he's in the other room watching TV. Uh, we haven't told him yet about his father because he's so young. I, uh, I, I take him with me when I go to visit Mauricio in the prison. I tell him that, um, that his father is in a school and that he'll be home when he, ay, uh, como se dice esa palabra, cuando se gradúa? Si, when he graduates, yes. Um, I, I visit my husband every week and I, I do that because I want Mauricio to know his son and I want Miguelito to know Mauricio también, pero no lo conoce bien. I mean, how well can you know somebody from across a wooden table and, and just on the weekends? Right now, it, it's the best I can do for my son. Uh, hmm. Well, I guess when, before, before he went inside, uh, things were very different. We were, we were just getting started. We were very young and, um, Es Chicano, mi esposo. He was born in Chula Vista in the United States. So, so when we got married, I became a resident. And, uh, and we were working very hard. And, and then I got pregnant. And, and we were so happy. But I, w I was alone when I gave birth to my son. Um, Mauricio got arrested three days before Miguelito was born and I had no one to help me. Toda mi familia estaba en Mexico. Estaba bien solita. And my husband's family, they didn't help me. They never wanted him to marry me. Me llamaban una mojada desgraciada. <sighs> no, I still see them sometimes because they want to see Miguelito, so they help me. I, um, I work a lot. I work from very early in the morning until 4 p.m. and mi suegra, the, um, uh, the, the mother-in-law, she picks up Miguelito in the morning and take him to a school and, and then she bring him to me at work in the afternoon and, and then we come home together, m my son and me, and, and I make dinner and I put him to bed. This is the time that I feel, I feel the most alone. I, uh, I think of my husband and how much he is hurting. Porque no tenemos ninguna idea de cuando va a salir de la cárcel. He has a life sentence, but it's my life and Miguelito's too. Mauricio is going to tell him before he turns seven. By then he needs to know. Mauricio is going to tell him not to trust anybody. My husband is in prison because he trusted people. People he thought were his friends. 
we don't have friends anymore. And it's better that way because I want my son to know that he can't trust anybody. He can't trust anybody except his father and me because he could go to prison too. I think about my husband late at night while Mijo is sleeping. I dream of Mauricio and what we will do cuando regrese. I'm 41 years old and a photographer by trade. I used to be a photojournalist for a while, but I had to give that up because I couldn't take the kinds of pictures that the newspapers wanted. I'm not interested in that kind of photography anymore. I, I got started when I was 17, when both of my parents went to prison. My father was selling drugs and, and my mother got picked up for holding them for him. So uh, funny part about it was that she ended up getting a longer sentence than he did because she was the one with the drugs on her when they got picked up. My mother's still in prison today. So, like I said, I started when I was 17 and I, I left home. I left Chicago and went to live with my grandparents in Philadelphia. I was kind of a rough kid, but uh, my grandmother straightened me out real fast. Uh, my grandfather bought me a camera told me to start taking pictures of everybody to send to my mother. That's how I got started. Pretty soon I was working on the school newspaper doing all the photography. But the more interesting work I did was out on the street. I became fascinated with people's faces. I didn't get to see my parents all that often because I couldn't get away from school and I couldn't afford to take very many trips to see them, so I saw them about twice a year at Christmas and in the summer. And I had to choose which one of them I was going to go see because I couldn't afford to get from both sides to both sides of the state in a single week to be able to visit them. I saw my mother more often. That was the way my grandparents wanted it. They hated my father, blamed him for everything, especially for getting their little girl locked up. I feel differently about my father. I'm not proud of him, but he's mine. You can't help belonging to one another when you're family. My father was killed in a prison riot, the guards fired live ammunition into the crowd of rioters. My father and three other men were killed, uh, several others wounded. So, um, so after that, I, I couldn't take pictures of people's faces anymore. I couldn't look anyone in the eye knowing that we had all somehow conspired to form this society, this government, this criminal system of injustice. My photographs changed. I, I started covering court cases, but I, I wasn't interested in the crimes or the court procedures as much as the bodies of the accused and their families. Everybody wants a headshot of the accused, a mugshot, and I refused to do it. I wanted no part in that. The press convicts most of these people before they've ever seen the jury. So I, I watched the families in the courtroom. I tried to see where they held the tension of the experience in their bodies and how they changed as they moved through the courts. Now this is a picture of a man accused of murdering his mother. That's his wife beside him. They're in the hallway of the Dallas courthouse waiting for the verdict. I love this picture because those people had dignity. You never saw them break down in court no matter how ugly it got. That couple maintained their strength by relying on one another. The jury was out on his case for a long time, um, six, maybe seven days. And when they came back, they found him guilty and put him away for 35 years. I will never believe that that man was guilty, but nobody asked me. He's still doing time as we speak. This is the last picture of this man in the free world. My project is families now. I wanna know what happens to those of us who are left behind when someone they love goes to prison and how that absence changes the shape of a family. Where do you put your arms when the person you used to hold at night is gone? How does your stance change when you can't lean up against your mother's side? How does a child walk to school differently now that her father isn't there to hold her hand? It's not like when someone dies and you mourn their passing and you learn that life will never bring that person back to you in the flesh. You live daily 
with a palpable absence, with the knowledge that the people you love are living and breathing in a cement box somewhere, that they are alive and in a place where they cannot be well. My parents have been rendered faceless by the criminal justice system, and they are far from alone because there are so many of these stories that will remain untold. Hi, um, I'm Ashley. I'm the one who called you about the interview. Uh, I'm sorry to barge in, but um, I'm writing this play about people who have family in prison, and I'd be really grateful if you shared your story. So if you don't mind, just speak slowly and clearly and talk into the microphone. Now, which member of your family is in prison? So the play is a compilation of many things. I did, my father did serve 20 years in the Texas prison system, and this is the first time that I've performed since he came home a little over a year ago. So yeah, that's worthy of applause. Thank you. Um, and he is very much in my heart tonight. There's a reason that there are not very many stories about crime in this play. And it's because I feel like we have such facility to have that conversation already. We know what we think about crime. We are ready to judge people. We are ready to say, this is how I feel about the kind of person who does this thing, whether we have context or not. And, um, and that, that message is very clearly communicated. We know how to respond to it. We know how we feel about it one way or the other. But I found in my own life that often when I said to people that my father was in prison, folks would want to know why. What is it that he did? How did he end up in prison? And um, for a long time, I didn't know how to say why that was so harm harming, harmful to me as a child. Um, but then I sort of figured it out. I looked around, and if, if I had a friend who said that her father was a dentist, nobody said, why? How did he become a dentist? What would make him do that? <laughs> and um, I was stigmatized by that conversation, and people didn't know that they were doing a bad thing to me. People with really good intentions had been taught that they had a right to that piece of incredibly personal information. They had a right to know what was the most terrifying, hurtful, awful thing that ever happened in my life, and I was supposed to offer that up if I had any way to talk about my father at all. And most kids refuse, and I usually refused. Um, and even now, I don't talk to the press about it. I don't say anything about my father's incarceration. I say a lot of things about what it was like for him to be incarcerated. Because to me and to my family, even though we spent six years in court before he went to prison, the 20 years and five months that followed were so much bigger. That was what marked my life. The trial was terrible. The way people talked about us and persecuted us in court was horrifying. But it was nothing. It was a drop in the bucket compared to what followed. And what followed was what nobody wanted to know until I started talking to people who had been through very similar experiences. And I, when I started writing the play, I was both, I originally conceived of it as a dialogue between people in prison and people who were not in prison. And so I put an ad in this activist newsletter from a wonderful organization called the Coalition for Prisoners' Rights. And like the good folks at the Crossroad Bible Institute, they do a lot of correspondence. So it's basically six senior citizens who sit in somebody's living room and send a lot of mail to people in prison, and they try to give them a lot of information about things like where you can get help filing a class action lawsuit, what do you do if, you need, if you're having trouble getting health care in an Oklahoma prison, you know, whatever. They're trying to help people, so they let me put this little ad in their newsletter that said, hey, I'm the child of a prisoner, and I'm a theater student, and I'm writing this play about people who have family in prison. If you'd be willing to answer questions, write to me at this address at the University of California. And within one week after the ad ran, it only ran once, and one week later I had 100 letters. By the end of the second week I had 200 letters, and by the, end, by the time I graduated two years later, more than 400 people had written to me, many of them multiple times, many of them sent 30 to 50 page letters. Because no one had ever asked about their families before. No one had ever cared. And I found, um, the families of prisoners were harder to locate and access, but I found that they were very willing to talk. You know, that when 
all I had to do, I have no idea if I can interview anybody because all I did was sit down and say, my father is in prison and I'm writing this play and would you talk to me? And sometimes people would talk for four hours without getting a breath because nobody had ever wanted to know. And, um, and I found it everywhere I went. I found all sorts of people who I wasn't trying to interview wanted to tell me as soon as they found out that this was what I was doing. So I, um, my car broke down and the tow truck guy was talking to me as we, he was towing the car somewhere. And, he, and I had just developed this habit of telling everybody that my father is in prison and I'm writing a play because that's what theater people do. We share too much. And, um, <laughs> and so, so I told the tow truck guy and he said, I just got out of prison a few months ago and I want you to talk to me and my whole family. And um, I went to, <laughs> I, this dates me a little bit, so forgive me young people in the audience, but when I started performing, the photographer monologue had a real slide projector with old fashioned slides. <laughs> Those pictures were taken by my father. My father is a photographer and um, the, all of the pictures in the photographer slides were taken by him, except for the one that I talk about for a long time of the two people in the courthouse, that is my parents. That was the last picture of my father before he went to prison. The only other picture in that series is one where there's like a torso of a man holding a toddler, and that came from one of the folks who wrote to me in prison. He said to me, you know, I'm not really very comfortable with writing. I think your questions are wonderful, but I just don't, I don't write very well. So I want you, I'm really moved by what you're doing and I wanna help you. So here is the only picture I have of me with my niece. And it just killed me. So I, I really wanted to use it in the show, but I didn't want, I didn't feel that it was appropriate for me to share his face or the child's face with the rest of the world. So I cropped it so that his face wasn't in the picture and hers wasn't either. And um, back in the day when you wanted a slide made that way, you had to get somebody to help you. And so I went to the photography store and I said to this woman that I needed a slide that did that and not to harm the original photo. And I, I actually blew up a copy of the original photo and sent him a nicer one back in the mail so that he would not be parted from the only picture of that precious child. But um, when I was having the photos made, this woman was asking these really insistent questions like, why are, are you sure you wanna cut his face out of this picture? What are you doing? And, um, and when I told her that I was writing a play and there's this monologue about how you can't take pictures of people's faces anymore, she just melted right there at the photo counter and she said, you know, my brother did 15 years and nobody in my family has ever talked about it to anybody and it has totally shaped the way I live my life every day. And that kind of thing happened to me all the time. It happens to me now when I still say I'm a professor who does this thing. Um, people still don't have a place to take it and now, um, thanks be to God, my father is home and my mother keeps calling and saying, we need a new play. We've got to talk about what it's like for people to come home. This is a totally different thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I have not yet had time to write that play, but I may need to just because my mother will not stop. Um, and because it's a play that really needs to be written because the struggles of people coming home from prison are um, equally as, as gut-wrenching and very different. I am filled with such joy and hope that all of you came here tonight and were willing to have such a thoughtful conversation um, and, and to w bear witness to the lives of other people in this room. So thank you for being here. Thank you again to Crossroads Bible Institute, especially to Amy and Kyle who did all the technical work on the show tonight and who were great in rehearsal yesterday. Um, it is an extraordinary blessing to be here. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of Crossroad Connection. If you're interested in attending an upcoming seminar, check our website out at cbi.tv to find out more information and sign up. We hope you'll join us again next week. And until next time, God's blessings.